Okay, today we are going to do a crash course on the lymphatic system and on immunity. Um, in previous versions of this course, we never got to teach this, but I still think it's important because a lot of what you do with um, examining animals and having the doctor diagnose diseases involves uh, the immune system. And so there's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the components of the immune system and the lymphatic system. We're going to describe the differences between specific and nonspecific defenses, um, compare and contrast the two types of specific defenses, which are um, cell-mediated and humoral immunity, and then describe the difference between active and passive immunity. Okay, so the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system we showed last time was sort of like this sump pump or extra fluid that appears in the body, right? So one of the jobs is to drain that excess fluid, and the other job is to transport lipids uh, into the bloodstream. Because lipids, as they're absorbed, are so large that they cannot diffuse into blood capillaries. They have to go initially into lymphatic capillaries. And finally, it's really important for the immune response. Okay, so components of the lymphatic system, We've got lymph, which is a clear fluid, we've got these vessels, and we've got primary and secondary lymphatic organs. The primary lymphatic organs is where immunocompetence occurs. And it's important because the, the cells that I'm talking about here are lympho lymphocytes. And how are lymphocytes different than the other white blood cells? They're specific. If we're talking about B and T cells, they have specific targets. They are your assassins. They are your hitmen. And before we release them to go do their assassinations, they have to go through sort of school and become immunocompetent. And immunocompetence, they help to recognize what their targets will be, because you want them to find their target and you want them to kill it. But what don't you want them to do? <coughs> kill other things. You don't want to be like, <laughs> you know, just like. So that's a lot of what immunocompetence involves, is screening these cells, making sure they can recognize the bad guys, but they don't just rec you know, react to any cell, because that's bad. When that happens, we have an autoimmune disease. Okay? Can you think of any autoimmune diseases in people or dogs? Okay. Well, lupus okay, is an autoimmune disease we see more frequently in women. Okay. What about another one? Leukemia is not necessarily an autoimmune disease, it's a cancer. Um, what else? MS. MS can, yes, autoimmune. Um, what else? Okay, even rheumatoid arthritis, anybody have the swollen knuckles, things like that? That's an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune diseases are no fun. Okay. Dogs can get autoimmune diseases as well. In the skin, they get pemphigus and things like that, cause these like, lesions on the nose and elsewhere in the body. Not a lot of fun. So we want to make sure that our B and T cells are adequately schooled before we release them to do their work. So they go to school in these primary lymphatic organs, the red bone marrow and the thymus. Where's the thymus located? Hmm? Yeah, well, that's a thyroid. People get it confused, but you're close. Just go down right here and it's a little gland that's around your heart. Okay. And it's actually largest in a newborn animal, and in an adult, it's a lot smaller. So this is an important site where T cells go to become immunocompetent. The secondary type of lymphatic organs we have are areas where the actual battlegrounds are. These are things like the lymph nodes and the spleen and the lymphatic nodules. So these are where our B and T cells are actually encountering they're uh, the bad guys and dealing with them, eliminating them if we can. Okay, so lymph is a clear fluid, sort of straw colored. Um, there's not a whole lot of cells in there. Any cells that are in there are probably lymphocytes. Okay, mainly it's water and it's proteins. Is that? Uh, and it's also a little bit of ions and electrolytes and stuff like that. Okay. Now remember that lymphatic fluid was derived from uh, blood that was filtered through capillaries and first became interstitial fluid and then was sucked up by our lymphatic vessels. Okay. Lymphatic vessels are kind of cool and they have these valves that lets fluid in but it doesn't let it out. And there's no real pump per se. There's not, the heart's not involved in pumping the lymphatic fluid. But what does happen is that animal moves around, it squeezes these lymphatic vessels and some fluid goes in 
And then when it moves back, the fluid gets stuck by the one-way valves. So it keeps fluid moving in a one direction. Okay. How does it get back to the heart? Well, it's circulated similar to the way that venous blood is circulated. I think we talked a few lectures ago about how if you stand still and don't move for a while, what's going to happen? You're going to pass out. All the blood's going to pool down in your legs and not enough going to your head. That's the same sort of system that operates to move lymphatic fluid back to the bloodstream. So we have these vessels with one-way valves that uh, keep lymph going in one direction, and the lymph is propelled not by the heart, but by skeletal muscle contraction. So as you move around, you s your muscles squeeze on the blood vessels and also the lymphatic vessels, and because they have one-way valves, it squeezes it back towards the heart. And eventually we'll show where the lymphatic fluid is added back into the blood uh, so that we don't keep losing blood volume and becoming lymph. Okay, so how is lymph formed? We showed it earlier. We'll show a second diagram. Um, this is the heart, okay? This would be an ar artery, okay? What is this right here? Capillary bed, and there's a vein. So as blood crosses a capillary bed, some fluid leaks out, okay? But no red blood cells, no white blood cells. And that fluid is gonna be sucked back up by our lymphatic capillaries. And then it's gonna move into larger lymphatic vessels and eventually it's going to be filtered in lymph nodes. Um, where on your body do we have lymph nodes? Okay, yeah, you're doing this thing. Behind your knees. Behind your knees, okay. Under your arms. Under your arms, okay. Mm -hmm. By the breasts and females, where else? The groin, okay. It tends to be anywhere where you have a pit, an armpit, a leg pit, you've got some uh, lymph <laughs> nodes, right? Okay, and that filtered lymph passes out a lymph node eventually is returned to venous circulation in something called the thoracic duct, which is located up here by the, um, I believe it's by the vena cava. Um, anyway, the lymphatic fluid will eventually be added back to the bloodstream and become blood once again. Okay. So we talked about our primary and secondary lymphatic tissues. So the primary is the red bone marrow and the thymus. Your book wants to add GALT. I'm not sure if that's correct, but that stands for gut-associated lymphatic tissue. We'll, we'll add it there with a question mark. Okay. Primary lymphatic organs is where immunocompetence occurs. It's the school for our B and T cells. And again, the secondary lymphatic, school, uh, secondary lymphatic organs are gonna be our battlegrounds, our lymph nodes, our spleen, and then we've got our GALT back here again. Okay. Um, Lymphoid cells, cells that we find uh, within the lymphatic system, are mainly going to be lymphocytes, but also some of our macrophages and something called dendritic cells. Okay. Lymphocytes we talked about before. It's a type of white blood cell. We actually have three types, uh, natural killer cells, B cells, and T cells. Um, so B cells differentiate into plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete antibodies. And if you write antibodies with a big B, you will never forget that B cells are the ones that secrete antibodies, all right? On the other hand, T cells don't secrete antibodies. They attack and destroy infected cells directly. Okay? But both of them are part of our specific immune response. Okay, on the other hand, macrophages, uh, even though they're not specific immune responders, they're still important <coughs> to the lymphatic system. Um, because they're there, they live within the lymph nodes per se, and they can gobble up cellular debris, some bacteria that move through the lymph nodes just through that phagocytosis. So here you can see some bacteria, these are staph bacteria, or rod bacteria that are being gobbled up um, by this very large macrophage. And then we have something else called dendritic cells. Dendritic cells don't really attack a pathogen on their own but they're kind of like that one brother or sister y'all that was our, always a tattletale, right? <laughs> so they'll grab a hold of it like bacteria, like, look, bacteria, bacteria. And even though they're not destroying the bacteria themselves, they will present it to a B cell or a T cell, and they will alert the B cell or T cell that there is a pathogen in the area. Because as it turns out, T cells cannot really see or detect a free-floating bacteria or virus in the bloodstream. I could be a T cell, here comes a bacteria, I'm like, hey, you know, I just let it go. But once that bacteria has been ingested by another cell, or let's say it's a virus that's infected another cell, 
as a T cell, I'm then made aware of that. Okay. If we take a look at the structure of a lymph node, you can see that there's a lot of reticular tissue in there. It's just a scaffold on which all our other cells can rest. We've got lymphocytes in there, and the principal lymphocyte we have within a lymph node is going to be a B lymphocyte. Okay. They're pretty much isolated to the lymph nodes where they're producing antibodies and so forth. We also have some macrophages that are in there as well. Okay, so lymph nodes filter lymph. Uh, a human body has over 600 lymph nodes in the body, each is about the size of a small kidney bean, something like that. Um, we already said that they occur in dense clusters and in dogs and also in people, in the armpits, uh, the groin, the inguinal area. Uh, we also find them in dogs in this prescapular area. And that's where our B cells are proliferating and amassing. And it's where they're encountering and potentially responding to any type of pathogenic organisms. Okay. So here's a diagram of some of the lymph nodes you want to check on the dog. The popliteal lymph nodes are located behind the knee, inguinal, and the groin. Axillary, underneath the arm there. Prescapular, in front of the scapula. And then submandibular, okay, up there under the mandible. And finally, parotid is right there by the parotid salivary glands. Okay. So when you take the 152 lab next semester and learn how to do physical exams, part of it will be palpating these lymph nodes to see if they're a normal size or if they're an abnormal size. Okay, lymph node anatomy. Don't need to know too much about it, in that, but they're mainly solid. They have a lot of reticular tissue in there on which we have a lot of our B lymphocytes and our macrophages. Okay, we can have some T cells in there as well. So lymphatic fluid comes in one end, okay, filters along these trabeculae or beams, and as it does, it goes to this meshwork of reticular tissue where our B cells are located. Okay, the filtered lymph exits on the outside or efferent, uh, efferent vessels. Oh, lymph nodes in people. Um, the lymphatic system is there to help detect pathogens in part, help return lymphatic fluid back to the bloodstream, but it can also be used by cancer cells. Okay. You've heard of the process where cancer spreads. What is that called? Metastasis. metastasis. And oftentimes, certain types of cancers, particularly breast cancer in humans, will metastasize by the lymphatic system. So it's like this secret highway that the cancer cells can use to spread through the body. And so let's say we have a woman that's being treated for breast cancer and they're going to potentially do a mastectomy, remove the breast, but then they're also going to do something called a sentinel node biopsy. They know where the lymph node is that drains that area of the breast, and then they're going to do a biopsy of it and see if that node is cancerous. Because if it is cancerous, how does this treat change your treatment options? Yeah, we want to be more radical in the surgery. We want to go further on, remove more of the lymphatic tissue, because if you don't, we have a good idea that cancer is going to spread anyway. If, on the other hand, we go to the sentinel node and we don't detect any cancer cells, then we're pretty sure that you know, the treatment that the surgeon has done uh, may be enough to prevent further spread. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll do this in dogs and cats. It's, it's not very frequently that they do a sentinel node biopsy, but it can be done. Okay, so back to our primary lymphatic organs. Those were the thymus, the red bone marrow, uh, and also, if we're going with the book, we're saying the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. This is where our cells undergo immunocompetence, where they learn how to be good B and T cells. And the first place we have is the thymus. Now, the thymus is around the heart, and that's the place where T cells undergo immunocompetence. So just remember, T stands for thymus, and you'll never forget all blood cells, where do they initially come from? Bone marrow. Okay. The B cells stay in the bone marrow and uh, undergo immunocompetence there for the most part. The T cells, on the other hand, leave the bone marrow before they're mature and go to the thymus where they undergo immunocompetence. And, you know, let's imagine like it's like a college that it's really exclusive to get into. So let's say like a thousand T cells, you know, go to the thymus to become immunocompetent, maybe 10 cells will make it through. So it's like Navy SEAL school or something. Um, except for the fact that the cells that don't make it through are killed, okay? 
they are programmed to undergo apoptosis. And why would we not want them to live? Yeah, they're not treatable. And they're also the cells that are probably either not very good at detecting a pathogen or are too random in what they attack and might attack your own body cells. And so it's your body's way or your dog's body's way of eliminating the cells that would self-react. And that all happens in the thymus. You have these follicles in there. And in the middle of the follicles, we think there's this big area that's just a bunch of uh, T cells that are undergoing apoptosis. We have something called regulatory T cells that help to prevent autoimmune diseases. But as a mammal or a person ages, uh, the regulatory response goes down with age. And so we can get a greater incidence of autoimmune uh, diseases uh, later in life. Okay, another very important um, organ in uh, cats and dogs is the spleen. It's important in humans as well. Where would your spleen be located? It's right here on your left-hand side. Okay, so we already talked about the spleen last time. We said it's a place where we reclaim and recycle worn out blood cells. Okay, so that's one function. It's also a place where we store a lot of extra red blood cells. Uh, particularly in cats and dogs, the spleen can be somewhat muscular so that uh, when that muscle in there contracts, it can force some extra blood back into circulation. It's also where we store a lot of platelets as well. Uh, and finally, it's, it's, where, it's one of the places where uh, we can encounter and uh, react with blood-borne pathogens. Okay, think about bacteria that get worked away in the bloodstream. This is where we would encounter those bacteria and where your B cells and T cells uh, could deal with them. Okay, so the anatomy there, we've basically got a capsule that's very, very fragile. Uh, if this organ, if you have an animal that's had any trauma or something like that, or even yourselves, if you get in a car wreck, it used to be the steering wheel would hit you right about here, and people would rupture their spleen, and the one thing they would do is just take it out and say, well, you don't need the spleen, it's fine. Now they try to leave a little bit uh, in younger people. Sometimes the spleen can regenerate, but you can live without it. Um, but it's just a very delicate capsule on the outside. And then the trabeculae are these sort of walls that go inside there, and they're a little bit muscular so they can contract. Okay, so what do we have in there? We have white pulp and red pulp. The red pulp mainly has to do with red blood cells and platelet storage, uh, whereas the white pulp has to do with white blood cells. These are sites where B and T cells can uh, live and uh, divide if they encounter a blood-borne pathogen. We also have lots of macrophages in here. Now, the macrophages aren't really there to deal with bacteria or invading organisms. The macrophages are there to deal with old, worn-out uh, red blood cells, okay? So when an old, decrepit, you know, red blood cell comes in, it's not like, hey, grandpa, it goes <laughs> and rips it up, and the hemoglobin is shunted away uh, to become bilirubin and biliverdin. Uh, what happens to the iron? What happens to the iron in hemoglobin? That was a question from last time. Hmm? No, that's, that's what happens to the bilirubin. So bilirubin goes to biliveridin and eventually stercobilin. That's from the pigment. The iron itself first travels to the liver and then travels back to the red, red bone marrow. Where we had this particular carrier molecule called transferrin that would transfer that to different places in the body and take it back to the red bone marrow so it can be recycled. Okay. So we have our spleen, we have our lymph nodes, and then we have something called gut-associated lymphatic tissue, GALT, or in the human books we call this MALT, or mucosal-associated lymphatic tissue. Basically, we have a lot of lymphoid tissue in your gut. Why do you think you have a lot of lymphoid tissue in the digestive tract? Yeah, what's going to be contaminated, do you think? Yeah, whatever you're eating. Has anybody worked at a restaurant here? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what kind of restaurant do you work at? Uh, I've worked at several, like, Asian, Japanese, you know, bocce grills. Okay. Like the, the factory. Did you all have the five-second rule? 
<laughs> I worked at a lot of restaurants and a butcher shop, and we had the five and sometimes the ten second rule. For those of you that don't know, if you drop something on the floor, you one, two, okay, it's still good. The germs haven't had a chance to grab on there. The point is that food, among other things, is rarely sterile, right? It's usually contaminated with bacteria and things like that. So one site where an animal is continuously ingesting things, my dog especially, is just like in the bushes eating whatever. And so this is a very uh, obvious uh, point where contamination and infection can occur. So that's one reason why there might be all this lymphoid tissue around the gut because that's one site of entry for these pathogenic organisms. So it's good to have sort of your soldiers mounted right around the port where the enemy might be coming in. Okay. Uh, within the galt, uh, one of the areas we have in mammals, uh, so people as well as cat and dogs, is tonsils. Uh, tonsils are uh, you know, located in the pharynx and they don't have a capsule per se. And you can see by this sort of architecture where they have these big crevices in there, stuff can get stuck in there very easily. And this is one way we think that the body can learn about the pathogens that are out there and begin to mount, uh, you know, create antibodies to deal with these pathogens in the future. Um, other areas within the uh, galt are things like Peyer's patches we find in the intestine. Um, again, we think they're more for immune surveillance. What's coming in the digestive tract? What do we need to be aware of? So there's going to be our lymphoid uh, cells there, our B cells and T cells, but there's also going to be our APCs, uh, our dendritic cells. Those are the tattletales that grab a hold of pathogenic organisms and present them to the immune system uh, for su surveillance. Okay, so now that we've gone over a little bit about what the lymphatic system as a whole does, we're going to concentrate on immunity, and we're talking here about specific immunity. So before we do, we need to go through a little bit of um, just vocabulary, and that has to do with the difference between antigen and pathogen. So an antigen is anything that elicits an immune response, anything that the immune system reacts to. Okay. Could be a bacteria, could be a virus, okay. but sometimes it's not anything that's harmful at all. Can you give me an example of something your immune system might respond to that's not harmful? Pollen, pollen right? Like, oh, here comes this pollen, ooh, I'm going to get you. But pollen on itself is not pathogenic, but our body's response to it is very uncomfortable. So pollen is still an antigen in that it elicits immune response, but it's not really a pathogen, right? We don't get infected by pollen. It just makes us have hay fever and things. So pathogens are disease-causing microbes. You think about bacteria, uh, viruses, uh, protozoa, and fungi. Um, just for review, name a disease that affects dogs that is bacterial in origin. Not rabies. Rabies is what? Virus. virus. That's a viral disease? Leptospirosis. Excellent. So leptospirosis is zoonotic disease, affects humans and uh, dogs, and it's caused by a bacteria. Okay. What about a disease caused by a fungus? I'll give you a hint. Most people call it a worm disease, but it's not. Ringworm, right? Ringworm affects dogs, cats, people. It's a fungal affection of the skin, uh, but it's not caused by a, ring at, uh, a worm at all. It's caused by a fungus. And finally, give me an example of a disease caused by a protozoa. Anything? Crazy cat lady disease. Toxoplasmosis. Okay, Giardia is another one too. So there's lots of diseases that can be caused by lots of different pathogenic organisms. Pathogen is something that causes disease. Okay. Resistance is our ability to ward off diseases by recognizing the pathogen. Now, when our immune system recognizes the pathogen, it's not looking at the whole organism usually. It's looking at a part, and that part can be called an antigen. And your book and other textbooks will use these terms interchangeably. They'll say, well, the, the immune system recognizes the antigen. Just remember that the pathogen can be an antigen. Okay, the antigen is anything that the immune system detects 
and can mount an immune response to. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the nonspecific resistance and that it involves cells that, um, you know, can ward off certain types of infections, lots of different types of infections. And then we have specific resistance immunity. So this is what we're going to concentrate on. Um, okay, backing up a little bit, nonspecific resistance is present at birth. Okay. It's good against a general resistance against uh, lots of different types of bacteria, viruses, fungi. Um, examples of nonspecific defenses include our inflammatory response to injury or infection, our phagocytes, that's going to be our macrophages and our neutrophils, and also we have a special type of uh, lymphocyte called a natural killer cell, which is sort of well, we'll take care of uh, lots of different cells. And then we have antimicrobial proteins. So these are all very generalistic. They can neutralize several different types of, uh, of antigens. Now, what's the first barrier to something getting into your dog's body? Skin. Okay. Skin is a very effective barrier. It's what we call an external nonspecific barrier. Why is it difficult for a bacterium to get through the skin? Hmm? multiple layers, and remember the outside layer is what? It's, it's dead, keratinized, and it's being sloughed off at an enormous rate. So even though you're a bacteria, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm on here now, and then, you know, that skin cell pops off and you go floating off. And so it's a very formidable barrier. Uh, same with people, too. Unbroken skin is an excellent barrier. The problem is what happens when it gets broken, when your dog cuts itself, or it's got allergies, so it starts licking its own skin off. We then have a route for infection. All right, so going back to our internal nonspecific defenses, we have our uh, natural killer cells, which basically attack any cell that shows an abnormal plasma protein. Um, the cells inside of a dog or cat's body have markers that tell its immune system, hey, I belong, whereas cells that invade have different markers which the immune system can detect and say, hey, you don't belong. And so the natural killer cells basically just wander around detecting anything that has abnormal uh, cellular markers, and then it goes about neutralizing them uh, and inducing apoptosis through a variety of mechanisms. But they're nonspecific. The phagocytes we already talked about, those are our neutrophils, our macrophages. They're basically gobbling up bacteria uh, and other cells that are infected and it doesn't matter really what type of bacteria they're infected with. They're good against a wide variety of pathogens. Okay. Finally, the last type of nonspecific internal defense is inflammation. Okay. What types of things cause inflammation? Injury. injury, right? Just injury. Okay. Your dog steps on a piece of glass, or my dog met a centipede the other day and got bit on the foot. Okay. The bite, the venom in there, uh, the damage to the skin causes inflammation, okay? Swelling. And that swelling is going to make our blood capillaries in the area more permeable. And because they're more permeable, it's also going to increase the rate of blood cells moving out of the blood into the tissues. What do we call that process? What was its name? It starts with a D. Diapodesis, okay, diapodesis is the process through which white blood cells move out of the capillaries uh, into the surrounding tissue because that's where the infection is going to happen. We don't want to wait until those bacteria migrate in the bloodstream. Then we've got septicemia. That's a whole other ball of wax. We want to take care of this bacteria right here. So any type of injury will release prostaglandins. Prostaglandins will cause inflammation, letting those white blood cells move more freely into the tissues. And then once they get close, they can actually follow the scent of the bacteria through chemotaxis, right? Chemo was chemical and taxis was going towards, you know, we we're going to travel that direction. For example, the, you know, moths and bugs at night have phototaxis. What is that? It's like, oh, light, 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 you know. <laughs> I have no idea what purpose that serves because it usually results in their death. But anyway, it's an example of another type of taxis. So here we're using chemotaxis to get to the bacteria. 
All right, so now into our specific resistance. Specific resistance is different than non-specific resistance for these specific ways. One, it is specific to the pathogen. Again, we are talking about the Navy SEALs of immune cells. They're only going to target one bad guy. Okay? They are not after this type of bacteria. They're after only this bacteria over here, okay? or virus, or whatever. The other difference is they have immunological memory. Uh, once they encounter a pathogen one time, they're like, oh, OK, I know how to deal with him. They store that memory, and they're able to deal with it better the second time, because we have memory cells. Now we said before, like red blood cells last like less than 120 days, and, and many of the you know, macrophages and neutrophils will last only you know, 15, 20 days. Some of these immune cells, the memory cells, can last for years, and some may even last a lifetime. And that allows us to have immunological memory and deal with a disease better the second time around. For example, can you think of a disease that you tend to only get once? Chicken pox, okay. That's not absolute. Some people do get it again and it's even worse. But we have <laughs> immunological memory to that and your body, even though it's maybe encounters the disease a second time, is able to mount such an effective defense that you never even know you were exposed. Okay, so that's the, the goal. And the third difference between nonspecific and specific is that the specific uh, defense is systemic. It operates all over the body because of our B and T cells. Okay, it's not localized to one place. Okay, so the two main types of specific immune defense are called humoral immunity, which deals with our B cells, and also cell-mediated immunity, which deals with our T cells. Okay, so first to our cellular immunity. Cellular immunity, think T cells. Uh, these T lymphocytes are acting against cells in the body that have either become infected with a virus or that have grabbed the hold of a pathogen. And so they're dealing with something we call endogenous antigens. Okay, what does endogenous mean? What does it sound like it means? Inside, that's all it means. It's a fancy word for inside. Okay, so this is a bacteria. Again, it's sitting there on the table. I'm a T cell, I don't see it. But if somewhere else were to grab a hold and be infected by this bacteria, uh, or grab a hold of it, and I bumped into that person, okay, or that cell, I would then be cognizant of it, aware of it. If that's my target, I would then be able to initiate an immune response. So T cells can only recognize and react to endogenous antigens. And once they do that, they'll eliminate that cell in a variety of ways. Okay, the other type of response is called humoral immunity. What does humor mean? Funny, okay. In the Greek, Latin, sort of the word, what does humor mean? Yeah, so what were humors? Green bile, I don't know. You obviously know more than me. But all those are, <laughs> describe what? They're all fluids, right? All fluids. So <laughs> humoral immunity has to do with fluids. And what's the one fluid we have in blood? What do we call that fluid? Plasma. So we call it humoral immunity because the immune properties are located in the plasma, not in the cells. So we can take plasma off from a person that's been exposed to a particular pathogen and give it to another person, and even though it doesn't have the cells, it still somehow protects them. So that's why we called it humoral immunity. And we now know that that humor that we transferred between people, that plasma, was effective because it contained antibodies. So the humoral response is due to our B cells. And remember, B cells secrete antibodies. We've already talked about our B and T cells. Just a reminder, B cells recognize exogenous antigens. That is, they can recognize a free bacteria. Okay. T cells only recognize endogenous antigens. Okay. All right, a second reminder, where did these cells came from? The initially, they all came from where? Red bone marrow. But when they underwent immunocompetence, where did the T cells go? Thymus. And where did the B cells go? They stayed in the bone marrow. Okay. They stayed in the bone marrow. Maybe there's some evidence that they can become immunocompetent in the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. But still, most textbooks are showing that that type of immunocompetence happens in the bone marrow. Okay. So let's talk about antigens and pathogens again. 
Remember, an antigen was anything that elicits an immune response. Okay? And so here we have an antigen. Let's say it's a bacteria. And the surface of that bacteria has specific proteins that are reactive uh, with our antigen receptors. And these specific proteins or glycoproteins are called epitopes. Epitopes are just small regions of that antigen that will bind to our T cell or B cell and elicit an immune response. And these epitopes are specific to the receptor on our T cells, or vice versa. Our T cell receptors are specific to these epitopes. And most T cells in the body won't be geared to detecting this particular antigen, but we do have a few. Um, and we'll talk about how we get these antigen receptors, but it's a lock and key fashion. If this key doesn't met this lock, they don't bind together, they don't react. Yes? So, are T cells the only cells that like, actually go out and like, find antigen? Like, no. What do the B cells do like, in the red bone marrow? No, B cells, that's where they become immunocompetent. Later on, B cells leave the bone marrow and they go to seed the lymph nodes. So, the bone marrow for B cells was like their school. Once they graduate the B cell academy, they live, you know, leave there and they go to the lymph nodes, they go to the spleen and elsewhere, and they can bind to antigens in the same way. So um, they have receptors that are specific to certain epitopes on that antigen. Now, if that's the correct receptor and if they bind together, this T cell or B cell will become activated and then the next steps will start. But it's interesting to think about, you know, where do all these antigen receptors come from? How does the body know in a newborn what antigens it needs to make cells to detect? Well, what about animals that don't have vaccines? The mother? Well, mothers, it's interesting, it doesn't actually transfer cells, so there's no memory to that. Um, the way that the mammalian body decides what it's going to detect and attack is not based on what it's encountered in the past, but it is based on just some reshuffling of DNA. So if we look at um, the fact that the antigen receptors are like keys and the antigens themselves are like locks, they're specific to one another. Imagine that you know, somebody says, okay, there's a brand new, what's your favorite type of car? Subaru. Subaru. Okay, there's a brand new Subaru here. And if you have a key that unlocks the Subaru, it's yours. Okay. Now, if you've got one key, chances are it's not going to be the key. But if you're a smart person with a lot of time, you're just going to sit there and start making keys, right? You make lots and lots of keys. Somewhere, if you make enough keys, one of those keys is going to fit. It's basically how the immune system uh, hedges its bets to say, well, there's lots of different antigens that shouldn't be on my cells, so I'm going to start making um, antigen receptors or antibodies to be able to detect all these t potential types of antigens even though I've never encountered them before. And so that's how the immune system works. We have cells that can detect and bind to Ebola, that can detect and bind to uh, cells infected with the HIV virus. They may not be very effective right now, but we do have those cells. Even though you yourself have hopefully never come in contact with Ebola, right? Okay. You have cells that can detect it and start to elicit an immune response. And it works the same way in dogs. So we have all these different genes that can generate up to a billion different types of antigen receptors, okay, just based on random chance. All right, so let's look at what happens if we're going to process an exogenous antigen. What type of cell can only detect an antigen uh, once it's been internalized in another cell? T cell. T -cell. So T cells are recognizing cancer, they're recognizing viral infected cells, and so this is an antigen presenting cell. You know, one was our dendritic cell. That was a cell that grabbed a hold of things and say, hey, look. But you can also imagine that this is just a normal body cell that's been infected by a virus. Now, normally, um, when that virus infects the cell, the cell will chop up some of those viral proteins, and remember the cells have its own like self-markers that say, hey, I'm a normal cell, leave me alone. But once it encounters a virus, it will chop up some of those viral particles and it will present those in its own membrane to say, hey, I'm a normal cell, but I've been infected. And so when a T cell bumps into these receptors, 
it will bind with a T cell, and then that T cell will become activated and know that an infection has happened. Okay. For B cells and T cells, they each have different subtypes. For example, the T cells have helper T cells. Those are the guys that are helping to recognize the antigens on our antigen presenting cells. Uh, we have uh, cytotoxic T cells. Okay. Those are the hitmen. Those are the ones that are actually going to do the killing. So the T cells will kill the infected cell. And then we have memory T cells. Memory T cells remember, and they live a really long time. And what happens is if we get exposed to that pathogen a second time, the memory T cells that are generated in the first response are going to make it much quicker to respond the second time around. Okay, so here's an example. We've got uh, a cell that is bound to a bacteria. This is our antigen presenting cell. Okay. It then, if it happens to encounter a memory T cell, or in this case a helper T cell, that has a complementary receptor to that bacterial protein, they'll bind together and that T cell will become activated through a process called co-stimulation. And then after that happens, this is the guy that has the right receptor. And there's probably very few of these floating around the body. So the first thing this cell is going to do is multiply. And it's going to make lots of cells that are identical that have the same receptor. It's like once you find that key that opens the Subaru, you're like, I'm going to make lots of copies of that because that's the key. And now I'll be able to open all the Subarus I want. Okay. Subaru, really? Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, at least he didn't say like a you guy. I, mean, I drive a smart car, so you know, what can I say? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, so our cytotoxic T cells are the killer cells. So here's our virus infected cell. Again, it's going to display some viral proteins along with its own proteins in the membrane. It's going to say, hey, I'm a normal cell, but I'm also infected. T cell will bind to that, and when that happens, say, hey, infected cell, die. And it's going to send uh, some chemicals over called perforin. What does perforin sound like it does? Perforates. It perforates. There's no saving a sick cell. We're just going to kill the sick cell by perforating its membrane using perforin, or we can use something called granzyme. Uh, both of these are going to be toxic to the cell, and they're going to kill the infected cell. See, it pops open. Okay, now let's look at humoral immunity. Okay, humoral immunity involved antibodies. Okay. And antibodies are produced by what type of cells? antibody. B cells. Don't get this wrong on an exam. Okay. All right. So B cells can bind to free antigens. That means the bacteria, the virus, well, at least the bacteria, doesn't have to be inside of a body cell. It can be floating around. So for example, here we have an inactive B cell. It binds with a bacteria that has a complementary protein. Once that happens, just like the T cell, it will become activated. And when it becomes activated, it's going to go through that clonal selection, make lots of cells. It also does this thing where it helps to alert the T cells. So it gets the T cells involved as well. And in the end of this, we're going to have lots of plasma cells. The plasma cells are the cells that make the antibodies. And they all are going to be churning out the same type of antibodies. Okay. But just like the T cells, we also have memory cells that are going to live for a long time and if they encounter that uh, antigen again, they're going to go back in here and start churning out uh, more plasma cells and making antibodies a lot quicker. Okay, so we have cell-mediated immune response and antibody-mediated response. Okay. With the humoral response, the antibody-mediated, the way that we kill the pathogen is through uh, our antibodies. And antibodies are proteins. And it's important to realize that most of the antibodies are floating in the, in the blood plasma. There's some that are actually receptors on cell surfaces, but most of them are floating in the cell plasma. Um, okay, We have different types of antibodies, many different types, and they're divided into four or five classes. IgG antibodies uh, are the most abundant. And Ig here stands for immunoglobulin. So it's an immunoglobulin protein produced by our plasma cells. So IgG antibodies are most abundant, and they protect against bacteria and viruses. 
These are the ones that are produced upon the first exposure to a pathogen. Okay? And they take a long time to take effect. So oftentimes that first exposure to, let's say, uh, a rhinovirus, you're going to get sick. Okay? You're going to get sick. But we'll start producing these out. And in time, the infection will become self-limiting. Eight to 10 days later, you should feel better. Right? There's a lot of rhinovirus going on right now, a lot of colds that people have. Um, IgAs. Um, our protection uh, in the mucous membranes. We find them in the mucous membranes. Uh, IgMs are the ones that are produced oftentimes when we've had a chronic exposure. And they tend to be more effective at uh, limiting microbes uh, after we've had a long exposure time. And then some of the other ones, we're not quite sure what they do. IgDs are found uh, as membrane receptors. And IgEs, your book was like, oh, I don't know, okay. Anyways, there's a lot that we still don't know about the immune system. How do antibodies eliminate pathogens? Um, basically, when I went to school, we learned that they eliminate them through this acronym called PLAN. Okay. So PLAN here stands for precipitation, lysis, agglutination, or neutralization. Okay, let's look at some methods here. So precipitation, sometimes the antibodies will bind to a bacteria and basically cause it to settle out of solution because they make it so big. And they clump other cells and other bacteria together. And they make it this big glob that just sort of settles down into the tissues or settles down into the bloodstream. And there, our nonspecific immune defense, our macrophages can come and gobble them up. Okay? So that's how precipitation works. Okay. Uh, the next one was lysis. What did, whoops, what did lysis mean? Yeah, we're just going to punch some holes in that cell and cause it to rupture. So that's lysis. Uh, agglutination, we said, precipitation. Agglutination and precipitation are very similar. I don't see how they're that different. Again, they're, we're causing big clumps of cells that are white blood cells, our macrophages, our neutrophils can come gobble up. And neutralization. Sometimes we can just render that pathogenic organism um, basically non-dangerous uh, non anymore. We can prevent it from replicating or something like that by binding to certain receptors in there. Okay, there's other things we can do. Uh, for example, something called opsonization. Does anybody know what that means? Okay. It means literally to make tasty. Um, and again, it has to do with our nonspecific immune cells, our uh, macrophages and our neutrophils. Because if we encounter a particular pathogen, and we're a B cell or a T cell, in this case a B cell, it's like sprinkling some very tasty salt on that pathogen and just leaving it be, and then you know that your macrophages are going to come gobble it up. It's like, I don't know, somebody's out in the woods camping where there's bears, and you're like, I don't know, put meat in their sleeping bag. That's how opsonization works. Okay. So one of the big differences between the specific and the nonspecific immune defense is this immunological memory. Okay, we have the ability to remember a pathogen we encountered long ago so that we can deal with it much more effectively the second time. And remember, initially we're making those IgG antibodies, but maybe on the second time around we start cranking out more IgMs. In any case, we have more cells that can detect that pathogen, and so we're going to be more uh, efficient in dealing with it. So let's look at exposure to, let's say, a virus. Who has a cold right now? Okay, Lois has a cold. When did you start to experience your symptoms? Oh, six weeks ago. Oh, wow, that's an abnormal one. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes they run seven or nine days or something like that, but usually if you're exposed to a particular antigen or a pathogen, the first few days you don't even know it, right? Okay. It's only after five or six or seven days that you notice, like, oh, my head's a little, it hurts a bit, and I'm feeling a little stuffed up. So when we're exposed to that antigen or pathogen, initially it takes us a long time before we start to manufacture antibodies against it. Because for any one pathogen, unless you've encountered it before, you probably have a very few cells that can detect it. But once they do, 
they start to go through that clonal selection, they multiply, and they start to crank out some antibodies. And eventually this helps us to deal with the disease and maybe 28 days later we're feeling better. Okay? Now let's look what happens if our second exposure occurs. During the second exposure, we've had more time to develop antibodies and memory cells so that the second time we're exposed, look at the number of antibodies we produce. We're much more efficient in producing lots more antibodies and so we can essentially eliminate that pathogen before we even know we're sick. Okay? You won't know you're sick the second time around if you have this really efficient immune response. So, why doesn't this happen for us with cold viruses? The viruses change, the viruses mutate. Yeah, they keep changing. The RNA and the DNA keeps changing, so it makes it difficult for our immune system to, to hold an effective memory against them because they change. Okay? But for a lot of things, this memory is important. You will never get infected probably by that particular strain of virus, but that doesn't matter because the virus is gonna change anyway. But it does give us you know, some protection against chicken pox and things like that. So that's why uh, immunity can be a long-lived process. Now, at the beginning, we talked ELISA. ELISA stands for enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. Okay, assay is just a test. Um, if you've ever taken a pregnancy test, you've used an ELISA test, right? You pee on the stick, and when you pee on the stick, what are we looking for in, in the urine? Yeah, we're looking for a potential hormone, right? And if that hormone is in a large amount, it can tell us that we're pregnant. The same, uh, yeah, the same HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, the same technology can be used to detect whether or not an animal or a person's been exposed to a disease. Because when you're exposed to a disease, you start to produce antibodies against it. Uh, for example, has anyone taken their animal in lately to have a heartworm test? No? Hopefully you should every year. Kendra? A couple months ago, right? Okay, you should because heartworm is really uh, prevalent here. And we want to know whether or not your dog is positive for heartworm before we begin to treat them with prophylaxis. Um, and so, for example, we would take some blood and we spend that blood down. We can use whole blood or serum and we put it in this test kit. And it basically, we break a vial and impregnated in this paper are some antibodies that will bind to uh, the antibodies that are in uh, the blood of that animal. If that animal has been infected with heartworm, it's going to raise antibodies against it. And this ELISA test will be able to detect it and there will be a color change. Uh, this one here is used to detect um, parvovirus. Okay? We don't always have to use blood. In this case, we can use feces, which is a wonderful <coughs> test. Uh, and if we have an animal that comes in, and what are the symptoms of parvo? <coughs> Diarrhea, okay just sort of malnutrition, diarrhea, and a certain smell. If you have an animal that has a lot of diarrhea and it's of a certain age, you want to think. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so that'll be fun on the online lecture. Um, <laughs> so if we have an animal with diarrhea and we're suspecting parvo, you can take some of that fluid, put it in there, and it will tell you definitively whether or not that animal's been exposed. So that's good to know. If we know that, okay, the diarrhea is potentially caused by parvo, we can begin to design our treatment that way. Unfortunately, parvo is just like, well, lots of fluids, it's maybe some glucose, but there's not much more you can do. But at least it can help you eliminate other possibilities. Uh, do you know of any other tests that we can do using an ELISA test? Yeah, feline leukemia virus. Okay, what else? I'm sorry? Tick-borne diseases, ehrlichiosis, uh, Lyme disease, all have antibody-based tests. And so these are really cool tests because they can often be done uh, very quickly. And all you need is like a $10. Some of the test kits are $20, but it's something that you yourself you know, can use in the field to help diagnose a disease. So you'll be dealing a lot with ELISA tests uh, later on uh, in your second semester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some are and some aren't. Wh which one are you thinking of? Right. Yeah, that's still it's still an ELISA test. Yeah, SNAP is doesn't mean it's ELISA. SNAP means it's made by IDEX. So and that they're <laughs> snapping. So 
And that's really hard because IDEX, if, if for you that don't know, is the sort of veterinary monster company that produces a lot of the equipment and diagnostic materials. And, uh, but their tests are pretty expensive. A heartworm test is like 10 bucks. And so I was the purchasing guy here for a long time on a limited budget. And I'm like, hey, I found that this like, place out in Saskatchewan has these ELISA-based tests you know, for like five bucks. And you know, people would be like, oh, those don't work as well. I'm like, well, I'm a scientist. Let's do a test. And so we ran a bunch of dogs through, some of which were positive, some of which were negative. Hey, lo and behold, they worked the same. They came up with the same results. But it's hard to tell people that, well, there's not a snap. I don't snap anything. How does it work? Um, but they're both ELISA-based tests. OK, uh, wrapping up today, we talk about immunity. And at the beginning of the lecture, I said, you know, how do we detect pathogens and how are we able to combat them? And you said, well, vaccinations. And vaccinations are a good way to prevent the animal from getting sick in the first place. Okay. Because sometimes in getting sick, we can develop an immunity against that pathogen. But maybe we don't want to get sick in the first place. So we can develop what we call active immunity by vaccinating. So active immunity is the type of immunity where we have uh, formation of B cells and T cells. And as opposed to passive immunity, the effects of active immunity are very long lasting. Okay, and so if we vaccinate an animal, let's say against rabies, how long is that rabies virus or rabies vaccine good? Yeah, one to maybe three years, we're not sure, but that's still comparatively long lasting, okay? As opposed to just transferring some antibodies. Um, passive immunity occurs when we just transfer antibodies. There's no cells involved. And so an example of passive immunity is when we have uh, a newborn calf and it's suckling at its mother's teat. And the first milk contains some what? Colostrum. Colostrum contains maternal antibodies. The mother's been exposed to certain diseases already. And so some of those antibodies can pass over and give that animal a very temporary immunity to those diseases. And very temporary. As soon as that colostrum is gone, the antibody levels begin to fall in that animal. Okay? And so it's not going to be good for a lifetime. The other problem with the maternal antibodies is if we do have an animal that's suckling at the time and antibody transfer is happening, the antibodies themselves can interfere with vaccination. And that's why there's certain schedules to have your puppies vaccinated. If you vaccinate before it, the maternal antibodies may inactivate that vaccine. So that's why there's this sort of danger period where you don't want your dog to be exposed to a lot of other dogs while the maternal antibodies are wearing off and before you can vaccinate. A second type of passive immunity is something called post-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, and this is something not so much for the animal, but for you. Okay, if you are exposed to a particular zoonotic disease, sometimes there is a prophylaxis. There's a treatment we can get to healthily hope prevent it. And can you give me an example of a disease we might have to do post-exposure prophylaxis? Rabies. Rabies. Has anyone here had post-exposure prophylaxis? Okay, Tina, you had it? So what did you get bit by? Uh, a stray kitten. A stray kitten. Where were you at? Um, I was in North Carolina. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was bitten by a dog in Papua New Guinea. And, you know, you go on the CDC map, and you're like, oh, there's no, no rabies here. And then you look right across the political border, and it's all red. And you're like, well, either all the rabid dogs are staying on that side of the landmass, <laughs> or maybe the country of Papua New Guinea is not screening that well. And so, yeah. So what was your post-exposure prophylaxis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'll give you the vaccine. There's a vaccine for rabies to treat. But at the same time, they'll give you antibodies in the place where you're a bit. And the antibodies themselves can, you know, help to reduce your chances of infection. So same thing if you're in a human hospital and you get stuck, you stick yourself and stick a patient, and you're like, oh, gosh, what's happened? Uh, they have some post-exposure prophylaxis that will reduce your chances of disease transmission. Anyway, just in summary, two types of humoral immunity. Remember, humoral immunity, we're talking about B cells, antibodies, active immunity. In active immunity, we have cells. We have memory cells that are remembering the infection. In passive immunity, we only have antibodies. And so antibodies are eliminated from the system fairly quickly. It's going to be short-lived. 
for active immunity, we have naturally acquired. That is, I got sick with chickenpox and now I'm immune to it. Or we have artificially acquired, which is, I don't want to get polio. I got a polio shot. Now I'm not going to get polio. Okay? Passive immunity is only transfer of antibodies. It can be naturally acquired through the colostrum of the mother or artificially acquired and getting post-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, are there any questions? <laughs>